what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Or is it the other way around? Or is it a thing at all during the era of Me Too? Well, let's see. Katie Herzog, writing for TheStranger.com, says Asia Argento demonstrates the flaws of hashtag believe women. After decades, centuries, eons of women being regarded as things to be used and abused by men, with the emergence of hashtag me too last year, it seemed like finally the reckoning had come, at least in some especially prestigious fields like Hollywood, media, government, and academia. R.V. Weinstein, James Toback, Charlie Rose, Tavis Smiley, etc., etc., etc. The allegations against these men were numerous, serious, well-documented, and I at least believed them, like a few other wary commentators. However, while I broadly supported the Me Too movement, there was one hashtag that made me feel just a little bit queasy. Believe women. It's not that I don't believe women in general. I am one, she says, but both then and now, the idea that we should unequivocally, no question, believe all women no matter their claims struck me as an infantilizing and potentially dangerous slogan that would eventually come back to haunt us. With the recent allegations against Asia Argento and NYU professor Avita Ranel, that time, it seems, has arrived. Asia Argento was one of the first women to publicly accuse Harvey Weinstein of sexual assault, as documented in a Pulitzer-winning article in The New Yorker. Argento told journalist Ronan Farrow that in a hotel room, the Cannes Film Festival in 1997, when she was 21 and he was in his mid-40s, Weinstein forced her legs apart and performed oral sex on her. I was not willing, she told Farrow. I said, no, 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 it's twisted. A big fat man wanting to eat you. It's a scary fairy tale. Oral sex, Farrow reported, was ruined for her. Considering this history, it may seem especially ironic that in 2013, when Argento was 37, she allegedly performed oral sex on and had intercourse with Jimmy Bennett, an actor and musician who had turned 17 two months before and whom Argento had known since he was a child. In California, where the incident allegedly took place, the age of consent is 18, which means if prosecutors decide to press charges, that Argento could be charged with rape. The allegations against Argento emerged on Sunday in a damning story published by the New York Times. According to the Times, Argento, who reportedly had someone of a maternal relationship with Bennett, was contacted by Bennett's lawyers in October of 2017, a month after Farrah's piece came out in The New Yorker. Bennett, according to the Times, journalist Kim Severson was appalled by what he saw as Argento's hypocrisy in speaking out about Weinstein, and in a notice of intent to sue, he accused Argento of committing sexual battery and sought damages of $3.5 million. The sexual experience, according to Bennett's lawyers, was so traumatic that he went through a downward spiral that hindered his ability to work. The parties eventually settled for $380,000 and Argento was, in exchange, given the copyright on a photograph of the couple in bed, their naked torsos showing. While Argento did not respond to the New York Times' request for comment in a statement reportedly given to Yashar Ali by Argento, she denies that she and Bennett had a sexual relationship and says it was the late Anthony Bourdain's idea to pay Bennett off. Sure, blame it on a dead guy. Lies, deceit, and self-destruction are not gendered qualities. They are human qualities, and women are not angels. They, we, are simply human. That some of us behave badly should surprise exactly no one. So, that was a few days ago. Today we have an update to this story. Looking at E! News, Elise Dupre tells us, A. Giargento admits to having sex with teenage accuser in leaked text messages. After Asia Argento denied claims of sexual assault published in the New York Times, TMC shared an alleged text exchange between the actress and a friend in which Argento seemingly confessed to having sex with her accuser, Jimmy Bennett, while he was a minor. E! News has not been able to independently verify the text messages. Argento allegedly wrote, I had sex with him. It felt weird. 
I didn't know he was a minor until the shakedown letter. TMZ also published a picture of Argento in which she and Bennett appeared to be shirtless and resting their heads against a pillow. In its report, the New York Times, citing the notice, wrote Argento, asked Bennett to take photos of the two of them together after the alleged sexual encounter. According to the alleged text published by TMZ, the unnamed friend asked about the photo taken in bed. Argento allegedly replied, you can see my kids. That's all. It doesn't mean shit. I wonder why they left the one word in, but they bleeped the other word out. She then allegedly added, he is standing up. Standing up, is it now? Or does she mean to allegedly say, at attention? During these troubled times of Me Too madness and the reality of the false accusation ruining a person's life, there is much at stake. Tied to the ideology of intersectional feminism, Me Too has its share of double standards too. They tell us that feminism is about equality, but when the long arm of the law reaches out towards the feminists, they don't want to be held to the same standards that they are peddling. It goes without saying that no one ever should be abused sexually in any way, shape, or form. Never. There is no excuse for criminal behavior. The new battle cry is that due process is some horrible invention of the white male patriarchy. We are told to always believe the accuser, but believing the accuser means to automatically try and convict the accused. There is no way out of this logic. What we should be doing is take every accusation seriously, then rely on the much maligned due process. We recently have seen many male feminists accused of misconduct, and I've made several videos of them, and they have as often as their non-feminist counterparts have immediately not believed the accuser. More than rumors, a prominent male feminist deferred a sociology award last week over what he called rumors about his professional conduct, but now a former student of his is putting a name and details to the claim. Michael Kimmel, distinguished professor of sociology and gender studies at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, said last week that he's deferring his acceptance of a major sociology award for six months over what he called rumors about his professional conduct. And while Kimmel's terminology was criticized as dismissive of his accusers, the harassment allegations against him circulating online and off were then anonymous. But on Thursday, one of Kimmel's former Stony Brook graduate students put their, the student's preferred pronoun, name behind a detailed account of what they called his explicit sexual talk, homophobia, transphobia, and general lack of respect for anyone but cisgender heterosexual men. In an essay published in Medium, Bethany M. Coston, now an associate professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Virginia Commonwealth University, said now was the time to share their experiences. And share she did. What we originally thought was another case of a Me Too male feminist not believing the accusations of his alleged victims turns out to be a case of the authoritarian left turning on itself and eating its own. From Medium, Bethany M. Coston, assistant professor of gender, sexuality, and women's studies, VCU dog lover, and mental health advocate writes on Medium, reclaiming my fear, I will no longer stay silent about Michael Kimmel, that horrible male feminist. While I don't want to downplay any hardships or bad feelings that Bethany Coston may have suffered, it is interesting to note that her complaints weren't of the rapey or grab assy kind, but more along the lines of microaggression. She says, To be clear, I find Michael and his perspectives to be securely rooted in a benevolent, sexist, second-wave feminist, trans-exclusionary frame of reference, which relies so heavily on stereotypical understandings of the gender binary that it also necessitates a homophobic understanding of sexuality. Well, that's a mouthful. To get an idea of her complaints, here are just the bullet points. Explicit sexual talk. A lack of respect for anyone but cisgender, heterosexual, or presumed cishet men. Homophobia in both academic and interpersonal spaces. Transphobia in both academic and interpersonal spaces. I'm not trying to lessen any hurt or harm felt by the suffering Bethany Coston, but these accusations, if true, are mostly intersectional microaggressions. 
Any unwanted dirty sex talk towards a subordinate is, depending on context, probably the worst violation we can come up with here. Although misgendering and dead naming and all the phobias that are racking up against him, it doesn't look too good for the male feminists here, does it? Well, we've wasted another fine several minutes on these important topics when we could all be out doing something important. If you feel that this or any other video on this channel is worthy of your time, please like and share. There is a disturbing trend of my video views not being counted, which I'll be talking about soon in a short talk about that topic. Goodbye.